Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, saints of God. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Now, this, this is the day. Or this is the day. This is the day. This is the day. No matter how you break that um, that that first up in its syllables and its emphasis on certain words, it's a most powerful, powerful scripture. This is the day. If we could just awaken every day with that verse inside of us, this is the day. And, and not even finish the scripture, not that we're changing scripture or manipulating scripture, but this is the day that God does this, or this is the day that I'm healed. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that it's all going to happen. Amen. He is a powerful God. He is a powerful, powerful, powerful God. And it is his desire for that power to be active in your life. I have a message today called any old bush will do any old bush will do this is a message that god spoke to my heart it was a reminder a reminder when i i had gone to a a a, a, a women's conference with a friend who had gone to this conference before. It was a very small venue, maybe just 30 or 40 women. And I had gone there just because I felt like the Lord had told me to go. And so we just woke up on a Saturday morning, went to this small little conference. It was only a few hours long. I think it was just morning, really. And we were in a U-shape, um, just the women in a U-shape. And the, the, the woman who spoke um, had a very powerful anointing on her. And at the end of the, the discussion, the, the end of the, the service, the end of the conference, she wanted to pray for people. And so she started over here at the end of the U and began to pray around the U. And she would stop at certain women and speak over them. And she did a few of them. And she came to me, and I'm thinking, Lord, you have brought me here for a purpose. I mean, I normally don't go to, to conferences because I just don't have much time to do other, other conferences like that. Um, too busy getting ready for our own or too busy getting ready for Bible studies or preaching or whatever we're doing. But God had sent me there. I mean, with a purpose, I felt, I mean, when the woman asked me, I immediately said yes. And it was the day before that she'd invited me. So this woman gets to me and then passes me. I'm thinking, Father, I believe I was, was here for a purpose, that you were going to speak something into me. There was going to be a word for me. And she kept going. And then all of a sudden, she came back to me and looked at me. And just with, I, I wrote it down. I wrote this, the, the prophetic words down because they're important to have down, to write down that you can go back to, right? And she wrote down, um, she spoke over me. And one of the first things she said was, I see power in your hands. I see fire in your hands. She said, I, I see fire from praying in your hands. Now she spoke other things, but I had almost forgotten that part of the prophecy. God had reminded me, I went back to it this week to look at it, to reread it. And so I, this is the message God gave me about fire in the hands. And I'm going, I'm using, God sent me back to Exodus for this, for this amazing teaching, right? Okay. So here we go. I believe, and I, I, I see it around me all the time, I believe that many of us live under the misnomer that we have to be some kind of amazing prayer warrior to have victory in our prayer lives. We feel the need to stomp our feet or shout or wave our hands or bang them together and beg God. You know, uh, sometimes we feel like we have to have names like Abraham, Paul, David, or Jesus to have power in our prayers, that our prayers can have, can have a, a fire in them. But I'm telling you, that is a vicious, vicious lie from a very frightened enemy.
Satan does not want you to believe that you have power in your prayer. He wants you to believe that you're absolutely powerless, that your prayers are futile, that they have no victory in them at all. And I'm going to show you today how much of a lie that is, because it is a, a whopper of a fallacy from a very frightened. Satan's afraid that if you begin to believe you have power in your prayer and you begin to pray, that things are, he is scared to death of that. Amen? So let me show you the scripture, and you're going to think this is wild, but let me show you. It's Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. And the angel of the Lord, now we know this is God, we know this is God. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight and why this bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Now, this must have been one amazingly special bush. It must have been chosen among all the other bushes because it was more beautiful than any other bush. It had to have strong branches and lush leaves. Each leaf was perfectly shaped and perfectly colored. I even think that this, bu this bush belonged to the right forest or to the right set of bushes. This bush was in the right place with all the other bushes. It deserved to be on the mountaintop in the midst of all these other bushes. It was formed from a perfect seed and nurtured its whole life for this one special moment. Sound silly? Of course it is. It's absolutely ridiculous. This was no special bush. This was an ordinary bush. It had not been cultivated to be this special bush. It had not been nurtured specifically over all the other bushes. This bush was not in the perfect place. It wasn't, it was in the right place because God had ordained it to be there. But there, the leaves were as normal as any other bush's leaves were. What's the point? That's you and I. That is you and that is me. I am an ordinary bush. I, there's nothing special about Jenny Fister. I'm as special as you are because I'm called of Christ and I belong to him. But my worth is not in what I think. I, I'm not special. I, I'm just any old bush. You are any old bush. There is nothing special about you. Until the fire of God comes upon you. And then this bush had amazing value and purpose. This bush became a vessel of God's voice. This bush became a vessel of God's voice. This bush became a vessel of God's fire. This bush became a vessel of God's holiness. Can you, that's you and that's me. The minute the fire of God comes upon me, I become a vessel of God's voice. I'm ordinary until the extraordinary comes upon me. You're ordinary until the extraordinary comes upon you. And when that fire of God comes upon me, I become a vessel of his voice. I become a vessel of his purpose and I become a vessel of his holiness. This is me. Jenny Fister becomes an amazing bush because of the fire of God. Nothing else made this bush special except the fire of God. Ordinary people 
in ordinary occupations, in ordinary lives, become these amazing power tools for God when the fire of God comes upon them. Acts chapter 4 is a, a, a wonderful intrusion into the ordinary. This one, this, all of Acts is a wonderful intrusion into the ordinary. In other words, things happen in Acts. I mean, the whole Bible is an intrusion into the ordinary because God does extraordinary things through it all. But Acts chapter 4, in one very special verse, is a wonderful intrusion into ordinary and to ordinary lives. And it reminds us that there is one, one God who makes a difference in everything we say and everything we do and every action we take. He is the fire that makes us different. And it's not based on being a special thing. It's based on God and God alone. Let me show you. This is Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation because I just want you to hear. This, it's like a commentary part of it. So this is New Living Translation, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men who had no special training. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. They were an, or, they, they were an ordinary bush, that, any old bush, just like the, the, the bush of Moses. They were ordinary men, but they could see something very different about them. And here's what they said. These are just men of a council who looked at me and went, now, now, this is the conclusion is an amazing conclusion because they went, well, what's different about Peter and John? Oh, I know. They've been with Jesus. Now, that's not the conclusion that I would come up with. I would say things like, oh, they, were, they had done this or they'd done that. They, were, they had studied here, whatever it was. But the conclusion was they'd been with Jesus. You see, that's the fire that changes us, that changes us and takes us from ordinary to extraordinary. It's the same basis of this scripture in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 says this, But God's chosen the foolish things, me. God's chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things, me, of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Uh, this will preach itself. This will literally preach itself. You are a bush that God is waiting to pour his fire onto and into that you might become a vessel of his voice. That bush couldn't speak until God came upon that, vo that bush, and then that bush still really couldn't speak, but out of the bush came the voice. I can't speak unless there's a fire. And then out of this bush, his voice comes. His purposes, God's purposes were fulfilled in that bush. Not because the bush did it, but because the fire of God came on it. So I, I just did this. Look at these ordinary people. A tax collector named Levi, Matthew. A simple fisherman, Andrew, Peter. Uneducated men changed the world. Abel was an ordinary man who simply brought an excellent offering to the Lord. He, he was just an ordinary man who brought an excellent offering to the Lord. Noah w w built an ark. He wasn't known for anything else other than being righteous, of course. But he wasn't famous. He was just a, a guy who did construction. Right? He was a carpenter or he was a contractor. That's all he was. Abraham, Abraham lived with his wife, with his dad. He lived at home with his dad, with his wife, Sarah, until God called him out to create a full nation and every blessing out of Abraham. But he lived at home with his dad. 
and his wife. Jacob was an ordinary father who played favorites with his children. Joseph was a regular teenager, a little arrogant, but a regular teen. Well, that's a regular teenager. Joshua was just an old man. He was just an old man who wanted to do extraordinary things. Rahab was a harlot. Ruth was an unknown widow from Moab. And yet out of her, she was Jesus' great, great, great grandmother. She was the great, great grandmother of Jesus a widow, a widow from Moab. The point is, God used all of these ordinary people, and God can take an ordinary person to do something extraordinary. These people were not chosen because they were great. Rather, their greatness came because they were chosen. Let me say that again. They weren't chosen because they were great. Their greatness came as a result of God's choosing. This bush of Moses wasn't a great bush. The greatness of the bush came in God choosing that bush to, to manifest himself in. I'm not great. The greatness, any greatness that I have comes because of God's choosing me. Your prayers are powerful, not because you're a powerful prayer warrior, but because when you begin to pray and you allow the fire of God, God's presence, the Holy Spirit to come upon you, you become a mighty prayer warrior, not because you're great, but because God's greatness is all over you. You don't need a lot of prayer. Uh, you, you, your prayers, let, let me, you, my mom in, w was diagnosed with cancer in 1999, and they'd only given her a few months to live. Now, she lived in Maryland while I lived here in West Virginia, but with the limited time she had, I would travel to Baltimore as much as I possibly could. I would go up for three days and come back for four. I'd go up for two and come back for, you know, three or four. Then I'd go up for one day and come back for five. I was traveling back and forth because I wanted to spend as much time as I possibly could with my mom. My mom was a believer. She had gotten saved at the age of 60 and died at 64. Amen. And she just wanted to go home and be with her Lord. She was still in the honeymoon, honeymoon phase with, her, with Jesus. And she didn't want to be healed. She just wanted to go home. And so I knew that that was going to be how God honored her life. And one time I was coming back from Baltimore and I was so tired. I was, I was just so tired. I had a headache that was pounding in my head. I had very little sleep the night before because my mother had had some, some real pain issues. And it was pouring the rain. And I had a very daunting four-hour trip in front of me. I called my best friend. Now, she's also gone off to be with the Lord. But she owned a Christian bookstore here in my, home, in my, my town. And I called her. And I said, listen, you're going to have to pray me home. I am just, uh, I, I have nothing left inside of me. And just then, a customer came through the door of the bookstore because I heard the bell above the door. And she needed to get off because apparently she knew this customer was going to need her attention immediately. And all I heard was, God bless her in the name of Jesus. Click. That's all she, that was the prayer she prayed over me. God bless her in the name of Jesus. Click. Within 10 minutes, my headache was gone. The storm had cleared, completely cleared. Not just stopped raining, cleared. And I had the energy, like I had just uh, had three or four cups of coffee. Now, what was it in her prayer that was so magnificent and so powerful and so mighty. She didn't, you know, go to the threshing floor. She didn't bang her head. She didn't pray, thou dost this, that. She didn't do any of it. Out of a heart that was on fire for God and a love for me, all she had to say was, God bless her and click. And he did it. What, what does that show us? She's just an ordinary bush. 
But when she had to pray in earnest and had to pray quickly, the fire of God only spoke through her. You see, the Holy Spirit just rose up in her. And all she said was, God, she needs you. She needs you. And the Holy Spirit took that with his fire and the flame. And he interpreted it to God. And God said, absolutely, I'll honor that prayer. And within moments, it was all done. How can that be? Well, didn't she have to go to her knees or go to her prayer closet? There are moments in our lives when we have to do that. There are times when we have to get alone with God. And we have to pray and pray and pray. Not for a breakthrough. You're not begging God. You're praying until you feel the breakthrough inside of you. You're not trying to break through to God. God's trying to break through to you when you pray like that. And there are moments you have to get alone with God in your prayer closet. And you have to pray until God speaks through you. You have to you know, go in the scriptures and find that scripture that you have to hold on to and cling to. And there are moments where you need prayer partners and you need someone else to come alongside of you in agreement to pray. These are all beneficial. These are all important. These are all critical to your walk in the Lord. But I'm here to tell you that your prayer is as powerful as mine or is as powerful as someone famous or is as powerful as your pastors or your worship. Why? Because we're all just ordinary bushes waiting for the fire of God to make us end up something extraordinary. Moses had a staff, a stick. He had a stick. Yet in the power of God, that stick became a staff that parted seas. David, <laughs> David had stones. He had stones. Gideon had trumpets and lights, and yet he scattered an entire invading enemy army. The, the, these are ordinary things. Rahab had a scarlet th thread, but that scarlet thread saved her entire family. What is it that we've been taught, and I erroneously, that if we don't spend hours and hours and hours praying, that our prayer can't be heard? See, I... Uh, uh, I come against that, and it may, it, may, it may come against teachings that you've had. This is not to say there are not times where you need to, listen, when you're around someone's bed and they are dying and you are praying for healing, you can't give up, right? I understand that. I'm not talking about those, those, those um, uh, um, high types of prayer and that, that kind of calling at that moment. But when you just want something for you and God, oh, friends, saints, your prayers are powerful. They are powerful. Let me show you. These are some ordinary prayers that were answered in extraordinary ways. Abraham prayed for a son. God gave him a nation. Asa prayed for victory, and a million-man army fled before him. The centurion prayed wanted a prayer for a servant, and he was healed the same hour. The thief on the cross simply prayed a prayer of salvation and ends up with etern in eternity with Christ. Amen. Jabez prayed for prosperity and God went, absolutely. The leper, all he asked for from Jesus was healing and God healed him instantly. Rebecca asked for wisdom in Genesis 25 and God revealed the unknown to her. Jonah prayed for deliverance and he got it. When God's people earnestly pray, when they earnestly pray, and they allow God's presence and his fire to come on them, when, when you let the Holy Spirit speak to you when you pray, when you allow the Holy Spirit to, to guide you in your prayers, when, when that happens, you're a force. You're a force to be reckoned with. You are not just an ordinary bush. You become a bush that is in, in, engulfed in the flame of God himself. James 5, we know the scripture. It says, that the, you know, the, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. It avails much. We know that. Um, I, I'm not pulling this up on the screen, but I because I just want you to listen to this. This is the amplified translation or version. Really, it's another commentary of James chapter 5, verse 16. It says this, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. It makes tremendous power available. 
You can count, you, you can count on the Lord to take an ordinary person doing ordinary things, praying ordinary prayers, because they're really not, and make them extraordinary. Remember when you pray, you are filling the bowls of heaven on the altar. Revelation 5, Revelation 8, both say that the, the incense on the altar are the prayers of the saints that the angels are dealing with. My prayer is as incense before God. And the fire of God accompanies those prayers on the return trip. His answers come fire down from his throne into our lives. See, when we pray, amazing things happen. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I'll end here. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, all that we think, according to what? The power that works within us. It's the power that worked within the bush. To him, that one, be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. And amen. The power in the bush was the fire of God, God's presence. The power in me is the presence of God and his holy fire, the Holy Spirit. He's a flame of fire. He came in the um, Acts chapter 2 as tongues of fire. He is the refiner's fire. And when we allow God to intrude into our lives in, in ways that, that we might be unaccustomed to, I'm telling you, you're not an ordinary bush. Any old ordinary bush will start, but he turns that ordinary bush, that ordinary prayer, into something so powerful because it's his power working in you. And out of you becomes a voice for him, out of you becomes a purpose and a promise from him, and out of you becomes comes a holy place because that's what he does when he invades you. He invaded the bush. Will you let him invade your life? Thank you for watching today's program, One Brush Stroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.